Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Our invitation song this evening will be another uh, number 109, if you'd like to go ahead and mark that. And before our opening prayer, we're going to sing number 38. First and third verses. Down where from cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. O precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, for every blessing that you give us. We realize, Father, that every good and every perfect gift comes from you. May we ever be grateful for these blessings and never take them for granted. Especially thankful, Father, for the spiritual blessings that are in Christ Jesus, your Son. We're thankful for his death on the cross that gives us hope beyond this life. We're thankful for the Bible that teaches us how to live our lives in such a way that we're pleasing in thy sight. We're so thankful for the the church, the body of Christ, and especially the congregation that meets here. May we always encourage one another and help each other to do the things that are right and to go to heaven when this life is over. We know there are many, Father, who need our prayers tonight, and we're mindful of each of those, and we know that you know each and every one who stands in need, not only here, but wherever they may be, and we pray for their needs to be taken care of, for your guidance and protection and care for them. We know, Father, especially there are many who are not where they need to be spiritually, and we pray for them to have the opportunity and the time to come to their senses and do what what they need to do to get their lives right with you, especially mindful of those, Father, who, who know what is right and for whatever reason, have strayed from it, there would be an opportunity and time to make those things right. Now, Father, as we continue this period of worship and as we dismiss to our classes, we pray for, we're thankful for the opportunity to gather tonight to do that, but we also pray that we would have our hearts and minds opened and focused on the things that we're studying, that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Good evening and welcome to the midweek Bible study period. I've been looking forward to this ever since Sunday. Hope you have as well. It's time for us to dismiss to our classes. We'll ask the teachers, preschool, elementary, middle school to go at this time.
I don't. Okay. Can you say something to make sure it's all right? Can y'all hear me back there? Oh yeah, I hear myself now. <laughs> I thought I was talking a while ago and I didn't hear anything and so kind of surprised me when I got the audio there. Uh, any of our members live in, how do, you, how do you say this? I don't want to say it wrong. It's a county, C-O-W-E-T-A. How do you say that county? Coweta. Okay, anybody live in Coweta County? <laughs> Nobody? Does Miss Gale live in Coweta County? No? Okay. Um, I, I just happened to see this. Um, I, I, did, I did not know about it until uh, Leroy Dedman posted something on his Facebook thing the other day and said something about he'd heard that there was, that GBN was on a cable provider in the Atlanta area. And it's Coweta and I want to say Fulton counties. You can go to Leroy's page and see where he posted something and then I think somebody from GBN responded to that. But um, I don't know if any of our people live in that area, but it's a, it's a new cable system. It's not like one of the big names, Charter or Comcast, but they seem to be trying to branch out some, so who knows? They could maybe come to this area and so it's, it's possible that if you just get um, cable through that company, then you'd have access to GBN 24-7. Of course, we, in our house, we have the Roku, so it's available uh, anytime through the Roku. If you have high-speed internet in your house, whether wireless or wired, uh, you can get 24-7 access to a Roku that costs, I don't know, what's a Roku cost now? I paid 50 bucks for mine. I think that's a kind of, that's on the higher end now, I think. I think you can spend up to 100 if you want to get the, uh, the Cadillac Roku. <laughs> but uh, some of them have, have dual antennas, so it's supposed to kind of help if one signal's lagging a little bit, it kind of helps boost the other one, I think is how that works. But uh, the, the base models, I think, are 40 or 50 bucks. So uh, you, can get, you can get GBN on that. And of course, if you have an iPad or an iPhone, they have that app as well, and, and uh, I think they also have the app for Android devices. So I just was surprised, because I didn't know. I, I usually, especially having formerly worked there, I usually keep up with what's going on with them a lot, but I, I had no idea about that, so uh, just, just making everybody aware. We began last week talking about influence. The Christian is influence. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it's, it's an old book by Brother Wendell Winkler, who's been dead for a few years now, but um, just about anything you can get your hands on that Brother Winkler did, it, it'll, it's, it's just very good. He, he always uh, had good materials. It's kind of like most preachers that I know would agree, if you have a chance now to go and hear Dan, who of course is Wendell's son, if you have a chance to go and hear Dan Winkler speak, uh, then take advantage of it because it's just a guy that, you know, you just, I've never, I've never heard him preach a bad sermon. There are, there are times when I think, boy, he just really, uh, that's one of the best sermons I've ever heard, but I've never I don't think I can remember ever a time hearing him and going away thinking, man, eh, that was just okay. It's always just like, man, that's great. Uh, and Wendell Winkler was kind of that way. Uh, it just, in fact, if you knew Dan, if you knew Wendell, and you see Dan, uh, it's it's almost uh, strange because he favors his daddy so much. Uh, and I, I tell him that every time I get a chance to talk to him, and I, I think uh, I think he likes hearing that. <laughs> I know if uh, if. if if you have a dad like that that's very encouraging and, and so helpful to the brotherhood, that's a, that's a good thing to, to model him in behavior, even more so than in looks. But they favor each other tremendously. But uh, Brother Winkler's book is excellent, Dealing with Influences, so we're going to be talking about that. We began this uh, discussion last week. Uh, before I get into this week's material, I want to just mention a couple of things that I ran out of time and didn't get a chance to mention uh, last week. We, were, we kind of closed out with the thought that uh, every step of the way, as we go through life, we are exerting influence, whether consciously or unconsciously. Uh, sometimes we may not even realize it, and, and sometimes it's, it's shocking to find out how much influence you have. Sometimes you don't realize it. Maybe it's, uh, I remember, seems like there's a moment, I, I talked to so many young parents uh, who are like me, and I had one of these moments when I was uh, just not, not been a dad very long, where the child says or does something and it just, <clears throat> it hits home really strongly. 
the influence you have just over that one soul, if nothing else. And, and it's a tremendous amount of influence. <clears throat> but sometimes we get to thinking we don't have much influence, but we do, whether consciously or not. Now, sometimes it's conscious. I think about the 12 spies, or, or the 10 fa unfaithful spies, rather. You know, they, they had influence, and they were consciously trying to dissuade the people from going into the promised land. But we need to realize that we all do have influence. Uh, we, we closed last week with Romans 14, 7, for none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. Uh, we influence others. We are influenced by others. You know, don't, don't take that for granted either. Understand you exert influence, whether consciously or not, but you also are being influenced by others. Uh, it may even be others that you have no knowledge of. How many people <clears throat> are influenced, and I don't mean in a good way, I mean in a, an extremely negative way by the garbage that comes through the television. I mean, you just think about it. I, I, get, I, I get frustrated uh, at some of the stuff that comes across. And there are some shows that, uh, you know, some, some are worse than others, there's no doubt. Man, there's some that are, they just put out some of the trashiest stuff. And, and, and sometimes somebody maybe puts on Facebook, you know, can't, can't wait. Uh, for the new season to start, or this is my favorite show, or I can't, uh, can't wait to see what happened after that cliffhanger or something like that. And I think, wow, you know, what, what are we doing? What are we putting into our minds? That's exerting an influence on us. Uh, we sometimes talk to our young folks, our children, and say, watch out, because the people you're around, they will influence you. Sometimes we say, and, and, and I've, I've been there, I've said it myself, oh, I can be around these people and they're not going to influence me. Uh, we're kidding ourselves if we think that. They will influence us in some way or another. Now, we'll talk about the fact that you've got to have contact in order to influence for good, but you've just got to be very careful because others will influence us as well, and we need to be aware of that. And then uh, the other thing I want to mention very strongly here before we get, move on to this tonight's lesson, we've got to be careful to guard our influence. Uh, we, we must be careful. Doc Haynes, there's a quote in here from Doc Haynes, who was the basketball coach at SMU, a uh, quote from the Dallas Morning News. He says, what I always tell my kids, talking about his basketball players, is that they represent the school and they represent the sport. If one of them should go into a beer joint in Fort Worth, for example, someone seeing him there would say, why, I know him, he's an SMU basketball player. And pretty soon the word's around that the SMU basketball team is hanging out in beer joints in Fort Worth. Well, you get the idea. In fact, uh, one of our Christian colleges, it may have been Faulkner, but they had some group. This, this happened recently when some of my friends were at the school, I believe, still, still attending there, where some group representing the school went and actually took a van. They were in a van that said the name of the university on it. It has the name Christian University or whatever. And they parked it outside of, I don't remember if it was uh, beer joint or whatever, went inside and were doing things that nobody ought to be doing, let alone, uh, you know, people who are supposed to be representing a, a Christian school. And somebody found out about it, somebody saw it, and uh, it just, it was bad all around. I mean, obviously, bad that these young men were even wanting to do something like that, to go into such a place, but the fact that they parked a van out there that puts out there for everybody to see. And that might be somebody's only exposure, you know. So, well, you know, oh, I, I remember, I've heard of that university before. Oh, yeah, I, I saw them, uh, one of their vans parked outside that bar that time, you know. And so uh, we, we've got to be careful to guard our influence. He makes a statement in here I like. Our influence is predicated on our reputation and our reputation upon the kind of lives we live. Therefore, to guard our influence, we must guard our lives. And that's absolutely right. If we live right, then we're going to have a better influence. Uh, that's, just, that's just a fact. Uh, you're going to have better influence for good if we're living faithfully to the Lord. Now, you know, we say this all the time, but we need to remind ourselves we're not going to be perfect. But striving all the time to do what is right. And when I make a mistake, uh, we used to have a, an expression when I worked in, uh, at Blue Cross. <clears throat> You're going to make a mistake. You're going to give out wrong information sometimes. It just happens. Uh, everybody makes mistakes. But one of the expressions that they always used to tell us, the team leaders and supervisors and all this, they would say, own it when you make a mistake. 
Don't sit there and deny it, rationalize it, and say, well, it wasn't really clear in training when they went over this with us. Just say, hey, I messed up, and learn from it. And I remember one of our training instructors, he said, listen, you're going to make a mistake. You're going to get, uh, QA is going to uh, pull, or uh, QC is going to pull one of your calls. There's going to be an error in there, and you're going to get... Uh, you're going to get a little official warning or whatever about it. And he said, that's fine. He said, the great thing about that is you'll never make that mistake again. And, and that's, that's what it is. You learn from those. But what will happen sometimes in our own lives, we make a mistake, we, we, we stumble, we sin, and we start saying, well, you know, if brother so-and-so hadn't done that, I wouldn't have. And if you hadn't have, we just start rationalizing instead of just saying, I messed up. You know, you think about David and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 12 when Nathan confronted him. You know, he could have said, well, now listen here, Nathan. And Nathan says, thou art the man, after telling him the parable about the little ewe lamb. He says, listen, that woman never should have been out there bathing naked. I mean, she's just right out there in the open. What was I supposed to do? I mean, you know, that's, that's on her. It, it was on her to an extent. No way you can get around that. Bathsheba messed up. I mean, she's just out there in the open. But... Did that make what David did okay? He sent for her. And this, is, this is something he's thinking about. He's premeditated. Bring that woman to me. And then he goes and basically kills her husband. He, he orders a hit, we would say in today's terminology, on her husband Uriah. But he doesn't try to rationalize the way, well, she shouldn't have been doing that. Well, you know, what was I supposed to do? Uh, you know, it's better than the whole kingdom finding out about this. And he just says... I've sinned, and he asked for forgiveness. That's what we need to do, and that's how we protect our influence. We guard our lives, and when we mess up, we say, you know what, I messed up. I'm human, I make mistakes. I made a mistake, I want to make it right. And we learn from it, and we move forward. That's how we guard our lives, that's how we guard our influence. Um, he closes this first lesson with a story about a, a little girl that passed away, and they were trying to figure out what would be a fitting epitaph to put on her tombstone, and they finally came up with this. It was easier to be good when she was around. I think that's a pretty good epitaph. That's how I'd like to be remembered. Somebody say, you know what? Uh, when that fellow was around, it was easier to do what was right. Uh, that's godly influence. Now, tonight, <clears throat> as I mentioned last week, I want to talk about um, being the salt of the earth. Uh, let's, let's go to Matthew's account and go to Matthew chapter 5. Mark and Luke record this, but let's, let's go to Matthew's account. Most people remember the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 to 7. And by the way, we'll mention this a little bit later, but what's this coming right on the heels of? Actually, I didn't give you a verse, did I? We're going to look at verse 13, beginning. But what is verse 13 coming right on the heels of? The Beatitudes. Uh, here's, <laughs> as I sometimes think of that as the attitudes you ought to be having. <laughs> um, sometimes people call them the be happy tudes and uh, he, he had another expression in here I don't think I'd ever read before. Let's see if I can find it. Where is that? The attitudes we ought to be, the beautiful attitudes. So the, people have different little sayings. But... Uh, this is coming right on the heels of that. So it's, it seems he's saying the people who practice the Beatitudes, you're, you're going to be the salt of the earth. Now somebody read uh, let you, just verse 13. That's all we need. Winkler in his lesson gives, gives three different major divisions of his discussion of this concept of Christians as the salt of the earth. He says there's a description to appreciate, there's a danger to avoid, and there's a destiny to abhor. Uh, Y'all know I like, I like alliteration, so I like that. I, I was sitting here thinking as I was going over this lesson, I thought, man, maybe I should have preached this, because <laughs> this will preach. But let's, let's notice, first of all, a description to appreciate. Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. That's the description that he gives of Christians here. Twelve observations that I want us to, to notice that he points out in this lesson 
concerning this description of salt. Number one, salt is an absolute necessity. I mean, it's just one of life's essentials, isn't it? You, you can't go without it. It's, it's like water, air, food. You've got to have it. Uh, you have to have a certain amount of uh, salt in your body even. Now, sometimes we get too much salt, and that can be a problem, but you've got to have it. Uh, in fact, he tells in here of uh, one of Napoleon's, uh, or some of Napoleon's men who died bleeding to death because they lacked a sufficient amount of salt in their body to make their blood coagulate. So their, their blood wasn't clotting because of a lack of salt. But Jesus wants us to see and feel our needfulness. Salt is an absolute necessity. Christians in this world are an absolute necessity because God has put the gospel into our hands, as we sometimes sing. Into our hands the gospel is given. And so God has commissioned Christians, we call it the Great Commission sometimes, with going into the world, preaching the gospel to every creature. That's what we are to do. So Christians are an absolute necessity, therefore. I think we all can, can see that. Uh, Paul said, bring Mark, 2 Timothy 4, because he's profitable to me for the ministry. Uh, we need to be profitable to the world for coming to Christ. Salt is an absolute necessity. Never, ever say, I'm a nobody. You are somebody. You've got influence. Use it for good. Number two, salt works at the expense of itself. Jesus said he came to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19.10. How did he do that? He did it at the expense of his own life, did he not? He, he gave up himself. Jesus never protested, look, I, I came from heaven. You know, he never said, did I leave heaven for this? You, you, you people, don't, don't you know who I am in the sense of having this entitlement mentality? He, he, he wanted people to know who he was in the sense that he was God's son. He was God in the flesh. But he never had that entitlement mentality. I think about Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, 15, where he says, I am willing to spend and what? To be spent. For you, Corinthians. I wonder how many Christians can honestly say that about our brothers and sisters in Christ or about those who are lost, bringing them to Christ. Are we willing to spend and be spent? I'm thankful to say I know a lot of, po a lot of people who are. I mean, they're willing to give themselves out, to give themselves up, if it'll bring somebody to Christ or if it'll build somebody up in the faith. But if we're not willing to spend and to be spent, I submit to you something's missing. Salt, salt works at its own expense. I also think about this with the concept of sacrifice. Brother Winkler has in his book, What is Christianity Costing You? What is it costing you? I think too often we don't stop and think about the word sacrifice and what it means. You see, an Israelite in the old, under the old covenant, every time he came for an offering, as they killed the animal, he put his hands on the animal. In other words, you're up close and personal when this animal is slaughtered. And I have an idea that that probably would help, help us remember the wages of sin is death. Without shedding of blood, there's no remission. But sometimes we forget what sacrifice means. And we throw that word around sometimes without even thinking about it myself included, and I st sometimes stop and think, is Christianity costing me anything? What, what has it cost us? Um, sometimes we need to think about that and make sure that, I'm not saying we just go out looking for ways to be inconvenienced by Christianity, but at the same time understanding that it'll, it'll cost us something. I remember reading about a guy <clears throat> several years ago that he and his wife liked to uh, sometimes people use the expression flip houses. You know, you buy a house, maybe it's a repo or uh, maybe it's been foreclosed on or something like that and fix it up and, and then sell it and make a profit. And some people enjoy fixing up a house. And so even if they may not make much profit at all, they enjoy the whole process of fixing it up. Uh, some people will do that and try to make a nice house for themselves. Well, this guy, he and his wife, they like to fix up houses and then uh, either sometimes they would sell them if they felt like I could get a profit uh, sometimes if it was a neighborhood where people rented a lot, they'd just rent it. 
and, and do it that way and make some money. But he fixed up this house that it was, it was in pretty bad shape when he bought it, and uh, he and his wife worked together on it, and they got it in just pretty, you know, pretty much pristine condition. He had everything done on it that he wanted to do. He was going to rent it. I think he said it probably would have gone for about 1000 a month in the neighborhood of where it was. They, they met this lady from, or she'd been there for a while, but they found out this lady from where they went to church was in need. Single mother, husband had just abandoned her, walked out. She had children, but she didn't have the means to pay $1,000 a month. And so he and his wife got to talking. They had some people from church. They had had some uh, drives or special projects or whatever to help her out, cook some meals or whatever. And he said, you know, we took her a meal and we felt pretty good about that. But he said they got to thinking about it and they decided what they really needed to do was to let her move into that house. And he says, you know, that didn't feel so good because I could have been renting that house out for $1,000 a month. And now I'm letting this lady live in it for free. He even, I think, decided to cover the electricity bill and things like that because this lady was... She, she was without a job. She was not somebody trying to take advantage. She was trying to get a job. And so they said, until you get back on your feet, here's what we're going to do. And he said, you know, it hurt. And he said, I knew I was giving up some money. But the guy was writing the article and saying, that's the whole point. Sacrifice hurts. It's not pleasant. Now, looking at the big picture, it is. It makes us feel good because we know we're doing what God would have us to do. But, you know, if I'm somebody that I've got... $20 left over that I'm not going to miss and I drop that in the collection plate or I do something for somebody just out of convenience is that really sacrifice but if I say you know I, I don't have much but I really want to help this person or I really need to give to the Lord or or maybe it's it's not convenient right now but a brother or sister calls me and needs help and there's something I can do, but it's just not a good time. What do we do in that situation? That's where sacrifice comes into play. But that's what salt does. It works at the expense of itself. Uh, number three, salt has to come in contact with the substance that is to be preserved, flavored, or otherwise influenced. It makes a good point here. Wisdom, tact, diplomacy are all needed in saving souls. In fact, let, let's look at a couple of verses. Brother Bob, would you look at Isaiah 50, verse 4, and read that for us? Um, who else can read? Brother Gary, Colossians 4, 6. And, Brother Allen, you read 1 Peter 3, 15, please. Isaiah 50, verse 4. Yes, sir. The Lord Jehovah has given me the tongue of them that are taught, that I may know how to sustain with words him that is weary he wakens morning by morning he wakens my ear to hear as though they are taught what version is that Isaiah 50 verse 4 yeah it's ASV. ASV, okay it might be a little bit off in the reading I was looking at it in the King James and New King James let me look it up myself here and see is anybody there Sometimes the ASV uses the, uh, I believe it's based off the Westcott Hort text, and so sometimes there'll be a little bit variant reading. Uh, 50 verse 4, what I was looking at, there's just a phrase in there, and it, it's worded just slightly different than ASV, but uh, that I should know how to speak a word in season. That's, that's basically the phrase I was looking for, knowing how to speak a word in season. And the same idea is expressed in Colossians 4, 6. Go ahead, Brother Gary, please. Letting your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt, knowing how to answer every man. And then uh, 1 Peter 3.15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks your reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. All right, with, with meekness and fear. In other words, tact, wisdom, diplomacy. And of course, James 1.5 says, if any of you like wisdom, let him ask of God. It gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given him. But here's the thing. We can get so hung up on tact that we never make any contact, right? And that's what sometimes happens. We get so worried about this, and I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. I don't want to run somebody off. And so we don't ever say a thing. And we don't ever exert an influence for good. 
because all we ever do is just keep our mouth shut and our head down and, and go about our business. And that's not influencing people for good. Uh, we talked about that in a sermon. You know, we looked at three mistakes in trying to influence people for good. And one of those mistakes was just assuming that if I live my life the way I'm supposed to, faithfully and striving every day to do what I'm supposed to do, that, well, hey, people will come to Christ. Well, if I'm living right, they're going to see my good influence, and that's a good thing. But at some point, I've got to, I've got to come into contact with people. Maybe invite them to services. Maybe talk to them about the Bible. Initiate some kind of a discussion that might lead to a Bible study or um, you know, passing out a tract. There, there's, there's so many different things. It, it really, really frustrates me when I hear people say that. I just, I'm just not a soul winner. It's just, that's just not my thing. Uh, it better become your thing because that's not something that Jesus says, well, you know, if you, if you feel like it, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Look, if it's your thing... Go preach the gospel to every creature. If you're comfortable with it, go preach the gospel to every creature. He never said that. He says, go. And as the uh, book says, is it Ivan Stewart? Go ye means go me. And there's a thousand different ways to do that. It doesn't have to be, I got to go out and knock on somebody's door. Maybe that's, you know, I, I understand that people have different talents and different areas where they're more comfortable or better. It, it may be writing cards. It may be that I knew of a little old lady that she was homebound and she would write, she would make phone calls, she would pay every single bill and put a gospel tract in every envelope. I mean, without fail. Now, some of those bills get mailed to New York and Chicago and stuff, you know. Did anybody ever come to Christ as a result of her efforts? I don't know. But you know what she was doing? She was sowing the seed. That's all God ever said do. We act like God said, go out and convert the world to Jesus Christ and you'll be faithful. And we say, I can't do that. Six billion people can't do that. And so we do nothing. But he never said that, did he? He just said, go, sow the seed. You take care of that. God will take care of his part. God gives the increase. We don't do that anyways. And what we sometimes fall into is, is when people do obey the gospel, then we start, you know, well, you know, I taught that guy. You can water, you can plant, but God's given the increase. And so I shouldn't get down if somebody rejects the truth. I shouldn't get too high if they accept the truth. Because at the end of the day, I'm just a servant. And so are you. But God wants us to go out and sow the seed. And that's influence. Salt has to come into contact with something before it can do what it does. And when salt comes into contact with a substance, it maintains its saltiness, right? And so what we've got to do as Christians coming in contact with the world, we talked about this just a moment ago, you've got to come into contact with the world to teach them, to influence them, to help them to come to Christ. But you've got to maintain your saltiness not becoming like the world, not conforming to the world, as Romans 12, 2 puts it, right? Be not conformed to this world, being transformed. That's, that's the challenge that we have. Number four in this list, uh, salt preserves and prevents. What do we do to preserve meat sometime? Salt it, right? Back, back in the old days, that was, uh, that was one of the ways of preserving meat. You salt it. Salt curing. Meats are salt to preserve them. The, the earth, which is one day going to be burned up with fire, Second Peter 3 tells us, is preserved by faithful, God-fearing, New Testament Christians. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, Proverbs 14, 34. I'm convinced the only reason this country is still standing is because they're good people that are trying to influence this country for good. Did you know Five, what was it, five people I think it came down to could have saved Sodom and Gomorrah from destruction? Five people exerting a godly influence could have saved that city from fire and brimstone. And they weren't even there. One person can save an entire nation from destruction. You say, man, that's, come on. One person can save an entire nation? You remember a man named Jonah? And he went to a city called Nineveh 
It took some persuading for him to go there, didn't it? <laughs> but he went, and he said what? Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And who spoke up? Do you remember? Who was the first responder to that message? It was the king. And the king said, we got to make some changes. And the king decided... We're going, to turn, we're going to turn to God, to Jehovah. And I don't know, maybe, maybe he'll turn his wrath away from us. And he did. And the whole nation, or at least that whole city of Nineveh, followed him. I think about a man named Josiah, who was a very young man. And Josiah could have said, hey, man, you know, I mean, I'm just, I know these people think I'm just a boy. I mean, what can I do? All these people, and they're so steeped in idolatry. I don't think it's right, but what am I supposed to do? Josiah, when he heard the law read, he rent his clothes, and he said, we've sinned. God's wrath is great against this nation. And he, he proclaimed a fast. He said, we're going, to, we're going to keep the Passover. And guess what? An entire nation followed his example. You think you don't have influence? You don't think one person can make a difference? Salt preserves and prevents. Uh, let's, let's go on. Salt purifies, number five. Uh, in 2 Kings chapter 2. Uh, let, let's, somebody, who wants to get 2 Kings 2 for me? 2, 19 to 22. Gary, you going to get it? Thank you, sir. 2 Kings 2, 19 to 22. You, you can provoke healing. As, it's going to be uncomfortable at first, obviously. But a cut... Uh, you can provo provoke healing and remove impurities from a cut with salt. Uh, again, that's not the most pleasant way to do it nowadays with more modern medicine, but salt will purify like that. Second uh, Kings 2, 19 to 22, please. God taking the impurity of the water away by means of salt. So salt can, can purify. And certainly Christians need to do that. And, you know, being an example of the believers, 1 Timothy 4, 12, one of those categories was impurity, as you, if you recall. Um, I think about Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You think salt doesn't purify? And in, in, in thinking in terms of Christians being salt, walk up to somebody when they're telling a, a nasty joke or a nasty story or maybe they're telling about an evening out when they were acting inappropriately and let a Christian walk up and what will they do? They'll say, oh, oh there, there comes so-and-so. Stop talking about that. Let somebody slip up and say a bad word around a Christian. They'll say, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> which I never understood. I've even sometimes, if I know the person well enough, I'll kind of joke and say, hey, don't apologize to me. I'm not the one you need to be apologizing to. But, you know, when a Christian walks up, they'll, they'll change the conversation from obscene to something purer, right? In fact, that ought to tell us something. If, if we walk up in a conversation and they just keep on talking, I might need to say, hey, wait a minute, what's my influence like on this person or persons? Sometimes people will walk up and even say, hey, you're going to like this one, and then begin to tell you something ugly. That might, that might tell us something. I need to, I need to do some self-examination. But salt purifies. And sometimes, many times, there's a Christian person walks up on a conversation that's ugly and it turns into a clean conversation. Purifying influence of the salt of the Christian. Uh, number six, salt can be destructive. Judges 9.45, Gideon sowed their city with salt. You ever heard of sowing something with salt. I think it was Attila the Hun that used to ravage and pillage and then he would sow the place with salt. You're not going to grow crops for a long time in a place that's been sown with salt. So salt can be destructive. You salt your lawn, guess what you're going to do for it? You're not going to grow nice green grass. You're going to 
grow nothing. It's going to kill it. Dead. Uh, so salt can be destructive. Uh, we also, if we get too much salt in our systems, we know bad. Uh, we get high blood pressure. And so likewise, there's a time to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, Jeremiah 1.10. But there's also a time to plant, to build up. So sometimes salt destroys us. In other words, sometimes we got to get in Ephesians 5.11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And people will say, oh, why, why do you got to be so negative? Why Just leave people alone. It's not trying to attack anybody. At least it better not be. If it is, then we need to get our attitude right. It's not trying to be negative. If it is, we better get our attitude right. But at the same time, I, I just followed a discussion. A uh, good, good friend of mine that I've, I've spent some time with at, at PTP the last couple of years and just love him to death is Todd Clippard. Um, well, Todd had a post on his Facebook page. I think it was Sunday. Uh, and, and I was following this when, when Jamie got on to me the other night. I was, I was checking my phone and, uh, at the, in line for the fellowship meal, but I was, I was checking this out because... Todd had made a post. He says, I love Duck Dynasty, but I think it's Willie that has come out and uh, talking about his role in this Left Behind movie. The Left Behind movie is a remake of an earlier Left Behind movie, which was based on a Left Behind book series. It's all premillennialism. It's about a guy who misses the so-called rapture, and he's left behind, and he lives through the tribulation and all this stuff. It's just premillennialism to the core. And, and the Robertson guy goes on and on about it, and he's just... You know, he's, he doesn't have any problem with it. And so uh, Todd, you know, said something about it. And he said, this just, this frustrates me. He says, I love that show, but I'm just really upset that he would come out and support such a damnable doctrine that teaches my Lord came to earth and failed. And I, you know, I, I, I get so frustrated at people that buy into that doctrine. And one of the comments that people made on there, a couple, one or two people, said, why, why don't you just leave people alone? Why do you got to try to tear somebody down? Just, just leave them. And one guy even said, well, have you contacted them privately? Hey, man, when, when something is put out over the air for anybody in America who owns a television to see, and, and many times even beyond America, that's, you know, when, when the Bible talks about going to somebody, that's a private offense. That's not what somebody teaches public false doctrine. Sometimes people used to say that about some of these notorious false teachers that used to be in the church, and now, you know, most of them, thankfully, have, have left the Lord's church. People say, did you, did you go talk to him privately? That's awfully ugly of you to say something about him publicly. Have you go, even gone to him privately? Did he come to me, me privately or you privately before he got up in a pulpit and preached soul damning error? No. And so when the Bible talks about going to somebody privately, that's in a private matter. We need to understand that salt can be destructive and there's times when we've got to point out false doctrine. I would not want anybody to buy into a doctrine that teaches my Lord came to earth and failed and said, whoa, what an unexpected turn of events. The Jews have rejected me. What, whatever shall I do now? Oh, I think plan B will be the church. I, I'm not going to stand by while somebody promotes that. I'm sorry. That, that is an affront to the Lord. That is an affront to his deity, to his foreknowledge. And it's ridiculous. Jesus knew what he came to earth for. He came to die on the cross to purchase his church. He said, I'm going to build my church. And it's in the eternal purpose of God, Ephesians 3, 10, 11. So salt sometimes has to be destructive. Number seven, salt creates thirst. You ever been around somebody that just makes you want to be a better person? Salt creates thirst, doesn't it? I, I've sometimes... I don't know what it is. I've, I've asked doctors, and no doctor can tell me that. They say, well, I don't know. It just, you know. Maybe it's just some weird thing I've got. But if I ever play sports or sometimes go for a long run, I absolutely crave salt. And I will come in, and I guess Miss Jamie can probably attest to this too, <laughs> but I've been known to polish off a jar of pickles and pour some juice and drink some juice. I just, it's like my body's just craving salt. I got to have salt. Sauerkraut. Pickles, what, you name it. If it's salty, uh, boiled peanuts. Regan made some boiled peanuts we got the other day. Anything salty. But you know what it does afterward? Man, you just guzzle in the water, right? I mean, just it creates thirst. But Christians, as a salt of the earth, ought to be creating a thirst for the Word of God. 
a thirst for Bible knowledge, a thirst for eternal life, for the peace that is in Christ Jesus. God forbid that somebody should ever look at my life and say, if that's an example of Christianity, no thanks. But you know what? It's happened. It's happened with me and it's happened with other people that I know there are folks that have looked my own life at times, maybe your life. I've repented of those times and I try my best not to be that now. But you know, there are some times that people look, I've had people tell me, I know who goes to that church. I know that guy, so-and-so. I, I, was, I was a member of a church, this, this is years ago, nowhere near here, but there was an elder. And you know, somebody in the community told me, hey, he wasn't an elder, I'm sorry, but he was kind of well-known, recognized as one of the out, upstanding men of the congregation. And a lady said to me and my wife said, I know that fella. And when he goes to his softball tournaments with his daughters, I know he doesn't go to church. She said, I know you think I'm not right going to this denominational church. She said, I know you disagree with a lot of Baptist doctrine. But she said, you know what? If I go out of town, I worship God on Sunday. That guy doesn't. He takes his daughters all the time to softball tournaments and they just skip church. They're on the ball field. And she said, I know when he goes to Tunica for those softball tournaments, I know where he is Saturday night before the tournament, for Sunday morning's game. When he gets out of Saturday's games, he's in the casinos. She said, oh, I know. Don't invite me to that church again because I got no interest in coming. That lady was one of the nicest, most moral people I've ever met. But there was absolutely no hope. Now, that doesn't make it right. You can't stand before God one day and say, oh, I knew somebody in that church, and boy, he was a real hypocrite. God's going to say, but what about you? That doesn't make it right. But God forbid I should ever be of such an influence that somebody says, if that's what Christianity is, I've got no interest in it. Salt creates thirst. If you're going to be the salt of the earth, you've got to create thirst. Number eight, salt gives flavor. Job talked about that in Job 6.6. 6. We can sweeten people's disappointments, lighten the burdens of others. The early church had favor with all the people, right? Acts 2.47. That's not to say always at all times. You're never going to please everybody all the time, right? I think we all understand that. It would be naive to think so. But the early church was a winsome church. They didn't... They didn't smart mouth if somebody was persecuting them. If somebody had a question about the Bible, they weren't cocky and arrogant about it. They just wanted to help people go to heaven. And I submit to you, we'll become a more evangelistic church when we live our lives the way we ought to and when we get that mentality. Not let me tell you what the Bible says about this. Let me show you how much I know. When we just get the attitude that I want to help people go to heaven. I want to go to heaven more than anything. And I want to take as many people with me as I possibly can. Number nine, salt blends. When you place salt in the food, it doesn't dominate the dish. It blends in. It brings out the best in the other ingredients. Isn't that what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27? The, I, the foot can't say to the hand, well, you know, what good are you? I, we don't need you. The hand can't say to the foot, we don't need you. You can't say, well, you know, that big toe is not very good looking. I think I'm just going to chop him off. Go try, to, go try to walk a little bit. Go try to run when you chop that big toe off. Even the pinky toe. You want to see how important it is? Take it off. See how well you can balance. The body works together. We would all do well as a spiritual body of Christ to look at our physical bodies and see the unity that they have. I, I mean, you know, the old illustration, you, you're hammering away and you hit that thumb. Man, every part of your body springs into action. Your hand and arm spring into action. Maybe you bring it up, oh man, you put it in your mouth and your mouth springs into action. Oh man, I'm screaming, I'm hurting. You, you, your feet spring into action, you're jumping around, you're hopping, man. I mean, it just, the whole body is, is, I mean, it's in one motion. It is concerned about that little thumb that got smashed. That's a lesson for us as Christians, isn't it? Uh, number 10, let me finish this list. Good night, where does the time go? Number 10. Salt is penetrating. 
Uh, if you place it in the food, it penetrates and influences the whole substance. It's aggressive. The early church was aggressive, not in a bad way, but they, they went out. They went everywhere preaching the word, Acts 8 and verse 4. That's how we ought to be. They influenced the whole known world there, Colossians 1, 23. Number 11, salt speaks for itself. I, I don't have to wear a sign that says, look at me, I'm a Christian. I don't have to put the little fish symbol on my car. Not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but we don't have to do that. If we're a Christian and we're living for God, our words, our deeds, our works, our attitude, how we dress, it's going to show it. People will know. How many times have you met somebody? I used to play with a guy in Chattanooga in the hockey league there, and I found out not too long before he left to go to college that he was a member of the church. And I told somebody, the guy, the preacher there in that church where the boy attended, I said, I knew he was a Christian. I knew there was something different about that boy. I never heard him use a swear word. I never heard him, uh, saw him act ugly. I never saw him use a bad attitude. Salt speaks for itself. And number 12, the presence of salt makes a difference. Does it make a difference in the local congregation here? Does your presence make a difference? Do people look around and say, where's, where's Chad if you're not there? Boy, we, we needed him in Bible class. We needed him for this. We, does it make a difference? Sometimes people say, well, they won't even miss me if I'm gone. Listen, that's more of an indictment on you probably than it is on the local congregation. Now, it, it could be the local congregation. But I need to say, if I, would, if I was gone and not missed, why? Why not? And what can I do to influence the congregation for good so that my presence is felt? Where does the time go? <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll pick up there next week. Good material. Thank you all for your attention.
Just a few announcements. Try to be as brief as possible. Give you an update on those that have been on our prayer list. Nancy Allen has uh, completed her surgery. She's now at home. We understand that the surgery went well, so she's got some recovery ahead of her, but we're glad that the surgery went well and she is at home. You asked to remember Chris Hodges has some upcoming tests. It'll be next week. Also understand that Brother Keith King was in a car accident this afternoon. Is he at home? Do we know yet? Don't know just yet. I don't think it was that serious, but we'll find out eventually. Lola Head also is at home and not feeling well. And Lisa Staples at home not feeling well. Any others that we should mention? Yes. Your mom? Not feeling well. Okay. Louise Smith not feeling well. Anybody else? Okay, several events. Brothers Keepers groups. Uh, group four, Chad Reagan's group will meet this coming Sunday after the evening worship in the fellowship hall, Finger Foods of the Fair. Group one, Robert and Cheryl's group will meet uh, Sunday week, that's September the 21st after the morning worship service in the fellowship hall. Potluck lunch in the fellowship hall after the morning service, drinks will be provided. You're asked to bring a food item to perk up the pantry, which is the September project for Robert and Cheryl's group. Group three, mine and Tammy's group, will meet Sunday week after the evening service, September 21, uh, potluck dinner, and we'll be preparing care packages for the college students. Group two, Gary and Jamie's group, will meet Friday, September the 26th at their home, 6.30 beginning, dinner provided, bring desserts and drinks. Ladies, you're reminded of the bridal shower for Anna Hill, bride-elect of Justin Reeves. That's this coming Sunday, September the 14th, here at the building from 2 to 4 p.m. She's registered at Target and Belk. Those ladies that are participating in the shower group are asked to meet down front for some last-minute uh, planning down front after services this evening for Anna Hill's bridal shower this coming Sunday from 2 to 4 here at the building. Also, uh, we have our family fall family seminar that's upcoming Friday and Saturday September 19 and 20 there's some flyers in the foyer also be on the lookout for this coming Thursday which I think would be tomorrow's local gateway newspaper we'll have an advertisement this week and also next week trying to advertise that to the community invite your friends and neighbors and see if they hopefully will be interested to come and participate with us in our fall family seminar September 19 and 20. Glenn and Cindy Colley are the speakers. There's a youth devo that's uh, slated for the evening of September the 28th, which is Sunday, the last Sunday of this month, after the evening service at the home of Hooper and Mary Sue Morrow. The elders, preachers, anybody who wants to go breakfast is tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, at Gwen's Restaurant in Buchanan for those who are interested. A couple of gospel meetings that are beginning shortly, one beginning at the Lithia Springs Congregation coming this Sunday through Thursday, September 14th through 18th. Barry Grider, who's the minister at the Forest Hill Congregation at the Memphis School of Preaching, will be conducting that meeting. That's uh, Sunday through Thursday, Monday through Thursday, each evening at 7 p.m. Lithia Springs. Sunday week, September 21 through the 25th, a uh, gospel meeting at Cedartown. Brother Keith Mosher, who's spoken here and also one of the instructors at Memphis School of Preaching, will be conducting that meeting Monday through Thursday, 7 p.m. each evening. The next area-wide singing will be hosted by the brethren at Lithia Springs. That'll be Friday, September 26th, 7 p.m., finger foods provided. And one last announcement. My youngest granddaughter, Laurel Stevenson, had her balloon tag found uh, in Belmont, North Carolina. And she got a nice little card from the lady who put it in a uh, little kitty cat card and sent it back to her, saying that it made it all the way to North Belmont, North Carolina in the community's high school football stadium. So isn't that nice? It made it that far. We're beginning tonight throughout this quarter having uh, young men rotating, extending the invitation, and first night is Brother Brian Wheeler. So Brian, come speak to us. I think they wanted to set the bar real low 
so the rest of the men would have uh, looked really good. But I appreciate the elders giving me this opportunity to extend the invitation. I was trying to think about what I could, uh, it's not really our invitation, it's the Lord's invitation, but I think what's on all our minds right at this time of year, every year, is September 11th. And um, I want you to think back 13 years ago. I imagine if you were alive, you pretty much know where you were around 8.46 in the morning. Think about when that first plane hit the North Tower, I'm pretty sure that everyone can remember that whole day after that. About 3,000 people died that day. 3,000 people that got up that morning and probably told their spouse goodbye for the final time. 3,000 people that probably kissed their kids on the forehead and said, I'll see you later when you get home from school. Think about that. 3,000 people who thought their life would continue on as they have done it every day. But 3,000 people whose life abruptly ended around 8.46 that morning. It makes me think about the passage from James chapter 4 and verse 14, where James writes, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. I looked up on Google a search, and I, I searched how many people die every day. And it's a sobering thought when you think about it this way. It said that almost 6.5 million people die every day. Um, 6.5 million people on this earth, in some way, fashion, or another, um, soul enters into the other side of eternity. I don't tell you this to scare you into a response, but I tell you this to re let your life think about, will you wake up tomorrow? And if you wake up tomorrow, how will you spend that day? If you don't wake up tomorrow, well, Jesus said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Are we ready to die? In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and, and 29, Jesus wants us to be ready. He said, come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus sends this personal invitation to each one of us. He wants you and me to be ready. How do we be ready? How can we make sure that we're ready? Well, the steps are so simple. The first thing we have to do is hear the word of God. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, For faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we hear the word of God, but that's, if you stop there, you fall way short. The next thing you need to do is believe. Jesus said, except that you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. If we, die, if we do not believe in him, then we will die in our sins. Jesus also commanded that we preach repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. If he wants it to be preached in his name, then it's, very, it's important that we repent. Repentance is not just something that we do. It's an action. It's a turning away from the sin that controls our life. After we repent, we must confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. A good example of this is the eunuch who said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. After this, we must be baptized of our sins. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, the Bible reads, And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then it says, After they were baptized in Acts chapter 2, they were added to the church you too can be added to the Lord's church after you complete these steps. But completing these steps is not just a checklist and then once you get all these things checked, you're able to go into heaven. After you do all these steps, it's necessary to continue on that straight and narrow path. And if you do not, like our brother Simon did who fell away, we must correct those immediately and repent of our sins. If we don't do these necessary steps, then unfortunately, when we cross over that Jordan, 
for the final time, we're going to go to the uh, hell. Think back to where we started this invitation. I want you to think back of, um, and think about those 3,000 people. What if tomorrow something bad happened to where you were and you were one of the people who were a statistic? Where would you spend eternity? Would you spend eternity with Jesus and God in heaven? Or would you spend eternity in hell with the devil? It's a sobering thought, but all of us have to think of this. As we sing this song, are you deciding to follow Jesus? Or are you deciding to follow what you want to do? If you have any need, please come forward as we sing this song. Dismissed in prayer, we'll sing number 395. Look forward to seeing you all at our next service, which will be Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for Bible study. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 and have a closing prayer. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus died for all the children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus died for all the children of the world. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for the lessons that we've heard here today and the teachers here. And thank you, Father, for the beautiful weather. We thank you for the church here in Bremen. We ask you to be with the ones that was mentioned here today that in need of your help. And we ask you to be with the sick and shut-ins in hospitals and nursing homes and the ones that's restricted to home. Just help them to have a better day. And we thank you for your son Jesus that made that offer sacrifice for our sins. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen.